See, the British Business Group is a group that is not very active now, but about three years back, they were very active, and in different parts of the country, like in Bangalore, they're very well known, the British Business Group. So we have partnered with them, and we've got other uh, sponsors and support people like the JCIs, the Junior Chamber International, which is a group of young people. We have the past president here, and then uh, our own secretary, Harsha, is uh, the present president of JCI. So basically, the idea is to get together people from both countries. The United Kingdom uh, celebrated in your week just about uh, two or three weeks ago how to do business in UK. And we, go, we have speakers from India who are going to explain to you the ease of doing business in India. So therefore, Thank you, Vijay. As we hold historical relationship with United Kingdom, what best place to invest for Indians in United Kingdom, and I think is the wife or is India is one of the most favorite place for United Kingdom to invest anyway. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would request uh, Miss Shanaz has been a great entrepreneur. She has a lot of hotels in Hyderabad, and you know a lot many uh, different kind of business, and she also have a resort in Spain, in case if you'd like to go for a holiday. <laughs> I request Ms. Shainaz to please come over here. And Fleming looks so uh, relaxed, you know, today, but I'm sure we're looking forward to the World Cup Finals in the evening. <laughs> but I request Ms. Shainaz no, to... No, no, I think that team didn't bring it on. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, learned uh, guests on Dars. Um, Zia has always managed to get me on the spot most of the time, but I, I'll try and do my best, give you some of my experiences and also some share some of my knowledge and uh, things that I have um, accomplished or been involved in. I was born in Hyderabad, so this is hometown to me. Um, schooling, studies, everything in the UK. Uh, worked with the civil service for really 20 years plus. Uh, social work, social services for the local communities there in, Wat in Watford. And I became a community rep or leader in Georgia for the first time around. But the second time I actually won. Um, and it was a, a really huge in those days in the 60s and 70s. My parents, when they first went, um, they struggled to settle in. And, um, you know, we were, they were the first people then, and, and, and as, as the generations were born then. And if you joined the system, then you only could make the change. So it was very difficult um, without the knowledge where a lot of people uh, didn't have uh, information or, or um, the knowledge of how to use the systems there. So that was a, a good four years of hard earned, you know, um, work that I did uh, to try and help and support the community there. Um, but it was too much time consuming, too many meetings. I was like 11, 12, 12 o'clock coming home with four kids at home, it was difficult to manage. So I decided not to really stand for re-election. So, um, but at some point I may go back and still dabble in something then, depends on how I feel. Um, then there was a new phase of my life. I left the UK in 2005, uh, went to, Dubai, um, because I fell in love with Dubai on the way to India. We used to always stop over there for holidays, for shopping uh, from the UK to India, because in Hyderabad there was no direct flights at those times. So um, I went to Dubai, because Dubai was a really huge hub for uh, entrepreneurs, for business, uh, and it's, it's still a huge market there. There's so many things happening there, so many opportunities. Again, a huge learning curve for me. I dabbled in everything from education to aviation to um, even helping and supporting relocation of UK companies into um, Dubai as well. I was helping UKTI um, in those days as well. So that was again a wonderful time I had there. Um, and because of my roots here in, in, in Hyderabad, my uncle and my mother own a hotel in Samajigura. 
um, they, they asked me to come and maybe help out a bit here in, in, in managing it. So when the recession hit in Dubai in 2009-10, that's when I came over to Hyderabad. And since then I've been sort of living here six months, six months in the UK, uh, traveling around, looking at um, opportunities to help and support family as well as my uh, friends and colleagues. So I've, I've built a lot of new friends here in, in India since I've been back. Um, working with ZR a lot, a, lot, a lot now in terms of projects, looking at investments here in India now, because again, India has huge potential here for investors. Um, and even to even sort of support your friends from UK to try and see whether we can do something jointly here. So I think, you know, um, overall, it's, I've had the best of both worlds in terms of seeing it from India as well as the UK perspective. Um, and there's huge potential I think India is, is the right place to be now in the next five, ten years. Um, the whole economy here is booming, it's growing, um, and I'm open to looking at what else is there to offer here. So thank you very much for your time here, uh, and I hope you have a good meeting today. growth Overall, uh, you know, everything, and that software, what she has developed, the, the overall company, has won many awards and you know I think we should appreciate you know she had a really good life in UK but she wants to come to India and contribute something so I think we should give her a round of applause too. Right, ladies and gentlemen I would request Dr. Kiran to please come and speak a few words. Thank you. Uh, let me thank uh, the Association of British uh, Scholars for inviting me over here. Always, uh, Mr. Zia is uh, you know, uh, a motivating factor. In fact, I'm uh, conducting very uh, influential programs, but also very good interactive programs, uh, you know, at least once in a month. And for some of them, you know, I'm a part of it. The friends, a couple of days back, uh, me and uh, Mr. Andrew, we are the part of a, a program conducted by the Telangana government at uh, ITC Kohinoor, and also followed by, after today's ISB and uh, government of Andhra Pradesh. I also did a program on our hotel Hyatt for the Economic, Economic Development Board of uh, Andhra Pradesh. Both the states, they invited the Western ambassadors and the uh, high commissioners and councils. And they explained about uh, what is happening in the state and uh, what all uh, the investment opportunities. So why I'm quoting this is, you know, a lot of competition is there between the states of uh, India now. If you look at uh, a couple of years back and right uh, you know, uh, right now, uh, the real working, uh, the governments are working really very hard to uh, attract the investors. Now, most of the policies, most of uh, uh, the schemes, what they are announcing okay, for the investors, it's really very good and uh, uh, they're fighting with each other. If you look at the Telangana and Andhra, they're competing with each other for the first and second rank. You know, Andhra, it's number one in uh, ease of doing business and Telangana, and then number two with a uh, you know, very few uh, less points, about 30, 30 points, uh, you know, the next rate. The British and uh, Hyderabad, especially if we wanted to talk about it, I and mean, uh, we have long history. And uh, the, what is important is uh, ease of doing business. That's very important to make uh, uh, the comfortability. If we go to any place, I mean, opportunities are everywhere. But what is important is, you know, if we go there, is there any secure security for our investment or uh, uh, comfortability is there, and the systems and uh, the law 
the land of the law, it uh, protects the investors, and uh, that is very important. But if you look at India, India is, uh, you know, uh, now the, across the globe, the people are feeling the very comfortable, even from my country, the uh, Republic of Bulgaria, I have a council for Republic of Bulgaria for the state of Telangana and Andhra. A lot of inquiries are coming in from, the, from here, the people are going over there and investing. I mean, earlier it was very, very less, but if you look at in the last uh, three to four years, I mean, a lot of uh, the people are venturing into uh, the Bulgaria from Bulgaria to, you know, they wanted to take the Europe route. So, what I request is, uh, 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 Mr. Adman, uh, make uh, the government also part of uh, your programs. Uh, the people to people, people to government is very important, so that uh, they will also understand and uh, they can make some announcement over here and the comfortability will be there and the investors who are participating in uh, this program, they will also get some access uh, to the secretaries and uh, Chamber of Commerce is also active in uh, this part of, uh, you know, uh, the world, uh, the Fritapsi and all, uh, Telangana Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, so, uh, this will really help I mean, uh, the people to understand and it will motivate, in fact, I mean, it will motivate uh, uh, them to think about you know, where to go, what to do and all. Especially in pharma, biotechnology, agri and uh, uh, information technology service sector and all. It's a booming and both in, in, uh, in UK as well as in Hyderabad and Telangana uh, as well as uh, in Maravati. If you do a series of programs, I mean, uh, at least uh, once in a quarter, <coughs> you really help the people to, you know, people not just doing a, a program and getting it out there, but until and unless we see the result and we see really uh, something is happening, you know, then uh, if two, three the guys are there inspired by this kind of meetings, definitely that will inspire some more people. So, uh, and really uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, the scholars. Uh, not only coming back to India, you know, going there and uh, exploring your uh, education or whatever, but uh, coming back and doing some service, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate and thank you for inviting me and whatever uh, the help or whatever the support you have in future, definitely I'm there. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we should be proud of Dr. Kiran for not just his success in business, but he's a highly intellectual person who does a lot of things for the community, always there to help and support young people, and uh, he does a lot of social work apart from his entrepreneurship and all. And we're coming to now the main part of this session. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our chief guest, Mr. Andrew Fleming, to please come over here. So, thank you, Namaskar, Um Fellow dignitaries of the Dines and ladies and gentlemen, it's really, really good to be here. I'm, uh, I'm happy that um, we started pretty well, Hyderabadi time. This is my second event of the day, and I'm a bit sleepy. I've been sleep deprived because of football. And um, my team's interest has ended now, but. Um, I shall remain loyal to my original prediction that Croatia will win the World Cup, <laughs> and um, and we'll see what happens tonight. Um, it's uh, it's really good to be among you and among a group of people that have spent time studying in the UK and have some association with the UK. You are exactly the kind of people that um, that um, I'm I'm really happy to, to to meet. My two team members here, Piyush and Baron, who are going to stand up and identify themselves, uh, have come with me. They're also very keen to meet you as well. So if I ask the question, what makes the UK a good place to do business? I'm sure many of you are already going to know the answers, but you'll have to bear with me because there'll be some people here that might not. Um, I think quality of life, diversity, culture, and common language are four examples among many of the why the UK is such a good place to do business. And um, like I say, it's a room for the people who've studied there. Many of you have studied there. Um, perhaps now you're looking to take your business there, or perhaps you will help the UK a little bit in encouraging others to come 
and do that. And by the same token, being from Hyderabad or elsewhere in the Telugu region, as many of you are, um, it's, it, it's the same, encouraging people to come, to come here, to come back here, to do business here uh, in, the, in the way that uh, Shinaz has, has, has done herself. Um, and, I, and my job is very much about promoting um, that in both, in both directions on behalf of the British government and working very closely with the Telangana um, state government and the Andhra Pradesh state government as well. Um, the UK has um, been a popular destination for um, Indian investment for over 100 years. And um, the same is very true in reverse. In 2017, the UK-India bilateral trade was in excess of 18 billion pounds in total, and that was a 15% increase on 2016. Over 800 Indian companies have invested in the UK, where they have um, generated um, 110,000 jobs, and last year um, they raised a record 47.5 billion pounds. So, I mean, the, 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 these are staggering statistics. And it, it was also right to acknowledge that last year's it was Indian investors who safeguarded more UK jobs than any other country investing in the UK. Conversely, the UK is the largest G20 investor in India, with one in 20 jobs in the formal private sector created by a UK company. In the year that I've been in Hyderabad, I've appreciated the strong match between the Telugu region of India and the UK. Technology and life sciences are two sectors where the UK and Hyderabad both excel. Healthcare, aviation, cyber security are among other areas of real strength. But I think that um, one outstanding feature is innovation. I believe that uh, Hyderabad is a city of outstanding innovation and I believe that um, not only London but um, many cities in the UK can also match that as well. The UK was recently judged the sixth best ecosystem for startups, um, or London was recently judged the sixth best ecosystem for startups, which doesn't sound very impressive. However, four of the other five um, were in the US, and the fifth was Tel Aviv. And of all of those, um, it is London that is growing the fastest. So I, I do take that as a positive, because the pace of growth is actually quite phenomenal. Um, and I think the attraction of London is that it provides a gateway to Europe. Not only to Europe, it also provides a gateway to Africa, which I think is a massively exciting market for those who are brave and it's, um, it's a continent I know very well because I, I visited 35 African countries and um, I've spent the bulk of my time in a diplomatic service based in, in, in that continent. Now, um, the UK are very keen to do all we can to promote and support startups and um, Hyderabad is a great place uh, to be doing that. One of the things that we um, have done on a regular basis uh, is run something called the Tech Rocket Ship Awards and this is a competition, an India-wide competition, by which um, a number of places each year are available for a um, startups to go to the UK fully, ex fully expense paid trips tailored to their needs to be able to meet the right people and be able to establish themselves in the UK and find funding. And by the way, London is a really good place to raise capital. Um, I was really proud that the last awards, we had 27% of all applicants in India coming from the Telugu states. I think that's amazing. And of that, um, two of the five winners were also from Hyderabad itself. They'd actually been incubated out of T-Hub. So we have another, 
another live competition going now. If you don't follow me on Twitter, my handle is andrew007uk. I tweet about it fairly often. You can also find out about it on UK in India and also our Department of Trade handles. Or you can speak to my colleague Piyush, uh, who is our key representative for that competition. But it's something that I might ask everybody here, whether it interests you or not, to at least help us promote and to spread the word off, because there will be people that will be interested. And there is some really impressive statistics of those who have gone in the past and have really um, gone on to achieve some great success. Um, at present, the UK has many other incentives to go and do business, and whether it's a startup or whether it's business on a much wider scale. At the moment, according to the Global Innovation Index, UK is the best country in the world to innovate, research and grow. Better than the US, better than Singapore, better than Germany, yet it's a position that we've held now for three years in a row. We are also increasingly cost effective. Currently, um, the most cost effective within the G7 for uh, the establishment of a new business and we also offer the most flexibility of wage determination across G20 countries. UK also has the lowest industrial labour costs in Western Europe and lower redundancy costs than our competitors like France, Germany, Netherlands and Switzerland. And finally in this list we have the joint lowest statutory corporate tax rate in the G20 and that's further scheduled to reduce, meaning it will be the lowest by 2020. Now I realize um, it's not always roses, and of course people can speak about the positives, but uh, we, can't, we, we, we can't overlook the areas we get criticized. I think visas is one area, Brexit is something that concerns everybody, um, and so I should say a few words, but just a few words about both. On visas, I think we have one of the most advanced online application systems. If you want to go to the UK, whatever your category, if you look at the website and follow the guidance that's there, you will be able to determine, I think, quite clearly whether or not you will qualify and whether or not you will get your, get your visa if you provide all the documents that um, they ask for. Now, my advice is don't go often use an agent. I, I don't like agents very much. I've had bad experiences with them myself, getting visas to go to other countries. But um, quite seriously, it's a very simple system, very user-friendly. And um, I commend that uh, if you have any skepticism about it, you can talk to me, you can talk to my colleagues, um, or you can just have a look at what is there. But what is really exciting, I think, is that um, when he was we had London Tech Week just um, last month, and um, during London Tech Week it was announced that we're introducing a new visa category that's going to start early next year, which is especially for startups and innovators, and that's going to be launched in the early part of 2019, which will make the UK market even more accessible for people that want to go and establish their business there. On Brexit, I will say, as far as I'm concerned, the UK-India relationship remains incredibly strong and will continue to remain incredibly strong. I've talked about bilateral trade seeing a 15% growth last year, a year in which everybody talked about uncertainty and doom and gloom and gloom. But 15% increase in bilateral trade between UK and India speaks otherwise. The UK is the primary destination for Indian investment in Europe. EU exit is a complicated process and it will continue to be a major focus for my government and their domestic political agenda. But our work on trade, economics and prosperity will continue and it will continue to the benefit of UK and India. That I can promise. As I've said, my team are here. I'll be around for a little while. Really happy to have um, had a chance to come and uh, interact with you. I wish you all the very best for the rest of the event. Thank you very much.
morning and I thank the Trade Commission, everybody who has taken time on the Sunday morning to be here. And that was, I think, too early for a lot of people. You know, they like to sleep late on Sunday. But ladies and gentlemen, it's wonderful to see the house full with all the uh, entrepreneurs, investors, and all the young people over here. And I think this opportunity, uh, first of all, to thank the organizing committee of uh, Association of British Scholars, specifically, would like also like to thank Dr. Murthy, who is sitting in the front. I think, sir, you should wave hand. Uh, he's a well person and also a well-known person uh, when it comes to the pediatrics department. And uh, Mr. Vincent, obviously, the most energetic person. And he's here, Rachman, Kamla, and Harsha. Uh, Vijay has already introduced you to Harsha. He is the boxer from United Kingdom. and. Uh, that's a lot of work. And I would like to specifically thank all the dignitaries on the stage, uh, specifically uh, Mr. Andrew Fleming, Shainaz, and Dr. Kiran. It was an honor to have you all over here. And uh, we will move forward uh, to have some coffee and interact with our dignitaries as well for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then we will be back here as we have some really good people who will be speaking to you, not just from India, but we also have uh, you know, people from United Kingdom uh, will be talking to us through Saturday. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Director UNICEF, a well-known personality, I request uh, Professor Lakshmi to please come and take a seat. She's on the stage. She will be hosting the session. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Vasya to please come up. Dr. Vasya, who is going to give us a speech on medical entrepreneurship. If you could enlighten the session for a few minutes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and be called on stage by Zia and the organizers impromptu. I'm glad to get this opportunity to speak about medical entrepreneurship. So I started my company called Genzer Technologies Private Limited uh, three years back. Uh, it has, we offer services in diagnostics. We have some clinical doctors and uh, our main focus is on stem cell research. And uh, my company is coming out with a device to isolate stem cells from fat and use it for autologous stem cell therapies. Uh, right now, I have uh, a grant from BIG, which is Biotechnology Ignition Grant. Uh, this is funded by Department of Biotechnology from Delhi. And uh, IKP Knowledge, the knowledge part here facilitates Hyderabadis to get this grant. And even out, outside, people outside Hyderabad also can uh, get the grant through different uh, uh, agencies. One of them is IKP. And uh, so I got this grant last year and I had to develop a proof of concept, uh, which is a device to isolate stem cells from fat. So right now I'm at the stage of uh, almost finishing it and uh, looking for seed funding to bring my device into the market. And as an entrepreneur, I would say the journey has been pretty exciting and challenging at the same time. Uh, but it's good to keep networking and meeting people uh, because you never know when you would meet the right person. Uh, it may not be the right time or there's no right time or wrong time. It's passion into work. So I'm looking to turn my startup into an enterprise and hopefully a big company soon uh, and get stem cell therapies in practice and hopefully cross all the regulations that are there in India currently. Uh, in some other countries, uh, a lot of clinical trials are going and there are very good positive results with stem cells, especially from fat, uh, which was not until recently thought of as a source of stem cells. Uh, so that's basically my work. And um, it, it, I would say this is a well-spent Sunday morning for me, a very good one for a long time. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for the interest. I am happy that uh, you have been, I am a professional field. And I am uh, sure that we will have more of a uh, lesson with her in future. Thank you. Uh, he works as a director of Nano IT Solutions and Nano Global Growth. Mr. Vijay, <coughs> focusing on building fruitful partnership with clients and delivering quality and high performing IT solutions. Mr. Vijay, through business consultancy and digital development, supports the business to grow. Thank you, Mr. Vijay. 
a climate reality leader and an animal rights activist. Ms. Vivina Vincent. Hi. All right. Yeah. Uh, she's a climate change communicator and gives presentations and workshops to increase awareness on climate change to the general public and schools. The culture of sustainable living and circular economy. And gives reference to the... Welcome. Welcome, Ms. Rubina. Welcome, sir. Yeah. I will now... Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yeah, a couple of case studies. Uh, in the services sector we've done, and just a bit of Brexit, I'm not going to talk anything more than what Mr. Andrew already had said, uh, but just a little bit of what is happening in the current uh, set here, so Nano IT Solutions uh, is an IT solutions provider, that's where I had, uh, I had most of my experience. So what we do is support companies in their digital transformation journey. Uh, we work with organizations who want to uh, track their customers, ensure their, their pipeline is very strong, um, uh, and then also use, their, use the cloud for managing the data and things like that. So, uh, in, in IT solutions, we also do, uh, so there are three services that we provide. One is the, uh, the business transformation area, so is where the customers are using our solutions, cloud solutions. The second one we do is business intelligence, try and use uh, the you know, Tableau and Power BI to provide solutions to the customers to manage their data uh, intelligence. Uh, and then finally we do some work in cyber security as well. Uh, what we have done uh, with, with that experience um, uh, is try and enter into other uh, spaces as well. So one of the things that we do, uh, that we recently started doing is Nano Green Trade. A nano green trade, uh, Vivina is the co-founder of the organization, she, she will speak more about what we do there. But very briefly, we try and bring products that are environmental friendly. Right? We've been using products ourselves, and it was very difficult to find their products uh, online, and you know, e-commerce, um, Amazon, and eBay. What we thought is there's definitely a gap that we can fill uh, with, with clear principles, with clear values, we've formed this organization, and definitely Vivina is going to talk about more. Uh, on that, um, IT recruitment. So we have uh, we have hired people for ourselves in our own projects, uh, and we understand how this this business works. And so now we have formed an organization called Nano People Source with the same principles that we would hire a person for ourselves. So we reach out to IT companies in UK uh, and um, you know help them fill their roles, both permanent and contract, uh, in various technologies, predominantly with the technologies that we work with. That's where our strength lies. Uh, yeah. Uh, today I'm, I'm going to talk about nano global growth. Uh, that's that's it's a business services, uh, and that's more relevant to what we are talking here today. So here, what we're trying to do is helping uh, businesses grow in UK, um, and this is predominantly from the experiences that we have gained by uh, by forming these companies and running these companies. So we have a channel of network uh, partners and. You know, organizations that we've worked with before who, who uh, you know, formed an ecosystem which can help organizations to do business in UK. So, if you move forward, uh, I'm not going to spend much time. Unfortunately, this is a lot of duplicate that Mr. Andy already has covered. It's good for me as well. Uh, yeah, easiest major economy to do business. And all this information we already know, and that's why I think we are here, trying to understand opportunities that can happen in UK. So I'm just going to skip this slide. So, uh, how we support? So this is predominantly what Nano Global Growth uh, is aimed to do. So we want to support organizations uh, in, in their journey. Just not, so I don't, I don't want to list down the services that we offer. So we, we support organizations through their journey of start, grow, and accelerate, which we'll see in a minute. Under the start, we, uh, we help organizations setting up UK business, advise them on UK business visa, and insurances that they need to have depending on the sort of work that they want to do. Uh, mind you, uh, uh, so, so you know the, the typical typical company. Um, you know there are a lot of organizations who wish to do business in UK. Uh, they have their own strength, which is their product, their offering. And uh, however, they, there are a lot of stuff that a company and organization must follow. Uh, uh, and quite honestly, all this information is available online. But this does take a lot of uh, work. Uh, to be done, right? This is a job to be completed to register an organization to manage accounts, manage payroll, and stuff like that. So what we are offering is is that they can focus on their core business, which is expanding their business, bringing their services to the market. 
and we are offering to support their backend company secretarial work. So that is the uh, background of our offering, right? And under that, you will see uh, within the journey, there are a lot of uh, activities that comes up, which we can uh, uh, say sort of backend sort of activity that we can pick up. And through our network of partners and, and um, you know, investors, we can then ensure that we help. Uh, so that's the, that's the premise really. So under the start, uh, yeah, so uh, setting up businesses, trying to understand what is the sort of business that, they, that best suits them, trying to understand uh, what sort of things are that work for them. Uh, so there are multiple business users as well. So we have, again, this experience comes from having our own people uh, working in Hyderabad for our IT organization. We have had uh, some interactions of ICT. This is interactive with transfers. People, you can have people move from uh, India to UK to work and, and stuff like that. So we, uh, it's coming from our, our own experience of what we have done for our organizations. If we go to grow, um, under the grow uh, stage of the organizations, then you, you have this UK tax essentials, which is managing the corporation and income tax, value added tax. These are all uh, pretty standard um, information is available and, and all the information. So, but again, filing them, interacting with HR, uh, the organ government bodies there, uh, ensure that your tax statements are filed properly. Um, and all of this is again uh, takes time. And, and the last thing is, is, is quite interesting incentive for R&D. So, government, UK government gives for startup and early stage companies a lot of uh, rebate, uh, tax intensives to doing R&D. And we have personally benefited from that. So, we have so if you're if you're if you're an IT organization and you're developing a solution that is that is quite new, you're using new technologies to develop it, and you face a lot of challenges. Uh, in that back, background, you can then claim R and D from the government, and this is quite unique from uh, unique to what UK uh, offers. And this is something that we have done for ourselves, and we can help organizations to to be able to create uh, paperwork and ensure we file it in the right way to get those incentives. And one of the case studies which I was reading, a company of one or two years, I think they were able to get the salary for the for 10 of their employees once they submitted uh, this R&D. So all the money that they spent on paying uh, has come back as an incentive that they could then off, uh, you know, burn, the, burn the money for some more time in doing that. Um, again, part of our recruiting, uh, we, will, we will be able to help finding the staff, um, which is again, um, as I said, permanent fixed term contract. And what, the reason I listed all of them is you need different type of um, you know resources at different stage of your project. At, at a very strategic leadership level, you need somebody permanent with you. And if it's a, if it's an ad hoc job, which is uh, which you need to get done sooner, then you can hire a contract uh, contract from the market. And these sort of um, uh, you know trying to understand what best suits you and try and propose that sort of uh, um, uh, you know uh, requirement is something that we have done, and we can then use that expertise to pass it on to the companies. Um, setting up UK office, a lot of people undermine, I'm not sure, I think, but they undermine this aspect of having a place for you to work and ensure you find the right location. Um, uh, and and uh, in the case study that I'm going to talk, uh, we have given our own working space to organizations to reduce the cost. They didn't want to take the cost burden, and we have given our own, shared our own offices with the organization in the early stage to, to increase and to grow. Uh, and, and we can help them find elsewhere as well. So if you've grown bigger, then we can find a place for them to go and start work. Uh, in the accelerate stage, uh, if this is where then they have they have set the basics right. They have un they understood their customer. They know their market. Now they this is just want to progress and move forward. So that's the place where we can, uh, partners through partners we can then bring the market intelligence and try and identify what is the best place, what should be the strategy of of company growth. Uh, manage their human resources if they need. Ensure that they have this uh, expenses submitted. Uh, they have the leaves and, and such sharp is this managed. Uh, and coming from from IT ourselves, if the company has uh, any IT implementations that they want to do within their organization, that's where we can support as well through information system implementation. So what I'm trying to uh, explain here is our organization um, is able to then provide this, um, I don't want to use 360, it's more customer centric, but give them overall um, you know comfort of trying to bring their product into the into the UK market and try and uh, you know focus on their business, and then there are other areas that we can partner with them and uh, you know guide them or help them to to reach their potentials. That's the idea. Really. Uh, so again, start, grow, and accelerate. I'll share the slides, um, and you could have, you could have uh, some of this information. Uh, so if I if I go to the next slide, we are just trying to put um, in one place what we give. Uh, our services are are in two. Business growth and consultancy solutions. 
business growth is, is typical back in the sort of office, which is accounting and tax services, payroll and company secretarial. Consistency solutions is where you get more of uh, the accelerate services, which is the market entry services. Uh, global mobility is again talking about people's movement from uh, back and forth and trying to ensure we have right, right visa in place for the people to come and work. Yeah. Um, so I briefly wanted to talk about the case study. Uh, so there are two case studies that I wanted to bring. So this is uh, this is a CSI a CIS worldwide is a business uh, um, is a Delhi based business. What they do is they offer IT services and uh, um, uh, support services. So uh, they have on their roles HCL and such companies who who have a lot of uh, demand for servicing their laptops and uh, services. So what CIS world does is if you they give marriage services offering, they get into a contract with these large organizations, and on calls, they can support companies to go and service. So as soon as you place a call, somebody from CS will go to HCL and resolve issue, fix the issue, laptop, or any of such stuff. What they wanted to do uh, was to was to uh, get in, into UK uh, uh, and expand into U. U. It's very lucrative because uh, at the minute, the current market value is 59 uh, billion pounds of this market. And they wanted to ensure, and the very, there are very big players playing in this. It's just you have uh, Wipro doing a lot, lot of business there, Action Share, Deloitte. All of these have their own IT services support. Uh, Wing, uh, which is doing, which is trying to uh, capture that market, and uh, you know, again, you have to have unique proposition. You have to have this experience to, to be able to manage uh, your field agents. So once you have that expertise, it is, um, uh, and they were brightly suited to replicate their growth and their success in UK into you. So what we have done for them, uh, again we have set up uh, so uh, set up UK businesses, we have organized a uh, business visa for them um, uh, through our solicitor channel. A um, couple of key things is, is again this co-working at Nano IT offices. So we have shared our offices as I said, and they were, uh, so there were two people who had come into UK in the beginning, they wanted to scout the market, try to reach out there, and they just needed, did not need much of infrastructure for those, so they, they could use our um, a space, which is their internet, your coffees, and all of that, and they can uh, so at a very competitive price. They were able to then start the business immediately. Uh, one of the other things that we have also supported them with is the uh, cash flow management and bookkeeping. So in our own organizations, we have a financial uh, officer, and we had um, you know the team, they had many conversations trying to understand how best these because it's very cost intensive uh, setup. In the sense, you need to pay for the. Uh, uh, the sort of field service first, and then you put invoice and get the uh, uh, later. So the payment is going to come later, 30 days or 90 days, depending on the contract. But you have to make a payment very early. So it's a lot of cash flow intensive business that they wanted to start, and they needed some guidance in, uh, in, in what's the best way of uh, uh, you know managing this and how sh how should the contract be structured in a way that it is not becoming very difficult for them to manage. So that is something that we had offered to them. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so they, they're growing, they have recently hired two more guys uh, to be able to do this business. They are trying to reach out to organizations to drive and do more contracts, uh, that's where they are. This, is, this case study is slightly different, this case, stay, uh, case study is, is India focused. Now we have partnered with one organization in, uh, in Hyderabad who, are, who do a lot of business, who support uh, Indian Defense and ISRO with their uh, with, uh, uh, shells of, of missiles or rockets. So what they do is they, they build, uh, they get contracts from uh, ISRO um, and DRDO to build certain components of a missile, Agni missile, Agni 3 is one of the recent projects. So what they tend to do is, uh, so they get, they will not get the whole picture obviously because of security reasons, they're going to get a structure of the, of the part of, uh, a structure and design of a particular component in this whole uh, rocket, they go back and build that and sell it to, to uh, the defenses in ISRO. Uh, what they're doing now is quite exciting. So they have, uh, they, ha they were part of this composite material uh, um, so research, and this material is, is much lighter, much competitive in the market, and they can build um, uh, similar products which are they faster to come to the market. And so they were part of the prototype uh, of business, uh, and then so they wanted, uh, so they wanted some investors to grow. So they, so this the whole plan that they had before is not suitable to build the components for. Uh, composite materials. What they wanted is to build the infrastructure first, and this is a two, three year plan uh, that the roadmap to, to bring the products. Uh, so what we're trying to do is try and find investors for them uh, in UK who would be interested in this area, uh, in this different sector, and then bring that investment back and trying to build that pitch 
uh, which we which then showcased UK investors as chief, somebody is interested uh, with not only money but also some sort of uh, advisory who can then help uh, the organization here to take the right decisions and ensure they, they, they are able to bring the product to the market. So this is the second case, which is a little bit different than what I have been talking about. Again, I've talked about uh, uh, our partners. Uh, so Trident, Accountancy, AY, and J, we use ourselves for our own purposes. Uh, uh, and uh, they are uh, quite reliable uh, uh, partners that we had. We've been interacting them for five years and above. So these organizations are going to help us. Uh, sorry for that. So we, these organizations are going to help us to uh, fulfill our um, uh, you know, services. Mm, uh, and ensure that uh, so so apart from this, all the business consultancy activity is 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 part of our own. Um, you know, so we have three directors who are going to help us those business consultancy work. But those back end activities which we talked about, uh, tax services, and then uh, so all of that is managed by our partners. Uh, this is a bit of um, a digress, but what I wanted to highlight here is um, there are other conversations that are much bigger than Brexit that is happening right now. Uh, which is quite relevant for what we are talking and what sort of organizations and businesses can set up uh, in UK. So if you see IoT, Internet of Things, um, uh, you know, home, smart homes where you have Nest and those sort of products, they are picking up quite well. Blockchain on which the Bitcoin, uh, so is cryptocurrency is built, is, is a very big organization. There are many projects that are coming on blockchain as, as a platform. And recently I've been talking to one uh, entrepreneur who started a digital mortgage. So it's quite a bizarre idea when I heard, I thought I'd share with you, is you, you have your website, you have your domain, www.xyz, that is an asset for yourself. Uh, that's a digital asset, which this company claims to mortgage it and give you cryptocurrencies, right? So they have created this platform on blockchain where you, uh, it's quite uh, quite unusual in the sense that uh, and your, your um, you know, it can be tied to the revenue that you're generating, so your value of the domain can be low, uh, high or low, depending upon how much money your organization is making. And depending on that, then the collateral uh, is higher, and then you can get higher cryptocurrencies to go and invest in other cryptocurrencies, if you like. Uh, so, so that's a quite interesting idea, and things like this are, are quite high, quite, the, the conversations that are happening are quite big, quite numerous now, and that's one of the emerging technologies. Uh, AI goes from newbie to mainstream. We, are, we have this example right here. Um, um, Ms. Shanas here has to leverage that technology and try and bring some products which are introducing products to the market. I myself had experienced this uh, the AI being conversational, quite common, and that is something that we uh, look forward to. VR, it's, it's a negative trend, so it's not many takers for that. It's quite bulky. I've tried to use it. My kids don't like it, so it's not much of a technology that's going on at the minute. The last statement which I have personally, we have personally benefited is digital transformation. Uh, people, um, they want, um, you know, it, it's, just, it's, it's ensure that the data is accessible everywhere, uh, ensuring that they have this transparency, teams are able to work with together with the information. So that is the sort of culture that people are moving into, uh, and that is uh, digital transformation, ensure that they have the right information at the right time, those sort of cliche terminology, right? Um, so these conversations are much bigger. So I had it before coming here, I was talking to my um, um, desk. So it's basically, there are events that are happening where people are talking about um, how a how Britain and the world itself ledges to these new technologies. And that needs to be roadmapped as well. That needs to be uh, planned as much uh, as we are doing Brexit planning as well. Uh, so, so that is a much relevant conversation and that's going to benefit if we, if we can focus on it. And um, a panel here uh, quite, even Andrew Fleming quite strongly said, Brexit for for our conversations is not much of an impact in, in itself. So because we are offering services, IT services which doesn't have any boundaries for sort of saying, and blockchain is made on that concept where uh, the world is one place. It's a single currency, and and that is it doesn't there are no boundaries for us to discuss there. So it's a very key takeaway for me on, on that topic. Yeah. So what I have also da tried to do is there are two slides I'll quickly wrap it up. Uh, well, uh, so the, the, there has been surveys that are done in the UK and trying to identify what are the uh, what where is the, where is the hurdle for companies to grow, and these were identified as barriers or missed opportunities. So companies are not able to grow because they scale down growth. So because of uncertainty growing down, what companies tend to do is to cut short on their investments, ensure they are not taking much risks, not moving into new markets. Tech crunch. Is, is where companies feel that they are not positioned right to implement digital transformation projects, where they think there's a big risk, they don't have right people to manage the projects, and they're not able to invest in, in technology. 
Uh, and this is definitely UK based slide. So they create a lot of products which are UK specific, uh, and then this are not able to take it to, to the market outside. Uh, and brand marketing and sales capability. Though if you have a product, you need to understand who are, so your proposition, right? You need to have your messaging right, your ideas clear to be able to take it to the market. So that is something that's lacking in some of the organizations. Uh, the next slide talks about uh, what is the growth generator mindset. Now this uh, purpose driven, so you, again you have to have your motto right, you have to have your proposition right. The second one really uh, uh, interested me is invested in top. So basically though these companies who are growing faster are not afraid to do um, uh, partner with other organizations. They are not afraid to do a merge, um, you know, buy acquisition, and they are investing quite a lot in the top line uh, at the time of uncertainty to ensure that. Those, uh, yeah, thank you. Helping. Uh, are you stationed mostly in Hyderabad or in UK? Uh, so, so at the minute, uh, for part of our IT solutions, we have a Hyderabad office. Uh, so we have a Hyderabad representation as well. But I'm, I'm working out of UK, uh, but again, uh, this is just sort of a, a difference. So, you know, a lot of my calls are on Zoom, on Skype, just get on to a call, discuss. Uh, yeah, it's much cost, cost effective, faster. But yes, if the short answer to your question is we do have a uh, Hyderabad representation. Nice. I have a Hyderabad office here. Uh, uh, one thing I would like to know uh, does uh, Pinterest have a presence in the British Council or the British High Commission come into the picture? For those who want to do business in UK, they they a uh, lot of the information. My research is based on their site. Oh, uh, so they, they have a huge high uh, presence and uh, and they, they they do marketing very well. So if you start setting up business in UK, the first ten sites will be international uh, uh, trade with uh, sites. So what happens is that the information is available. Again, where we are coming into the picture is ensure we save the time. The information is there, you know the steps, they're very transparent, and that's one of the key things for doing business in UK as well. Uh, so, so yes, as far as information is concerned, uh, UK trade are, are very proactive, uh, and then you can reach out to them directly as well. Probably but those calls can be diverted to some of us like us, uh, but yeah, their, their presence is quite strong. Uh, I think we are lucky that they are stationed here yes. to help the people Absolutely. who want to from that's a trade show and expo which happened for 23 nations in 2013 and we are planning for maybe 40 nations. Uh, would you be interested in providing UK based assistance for other nations that want to yeah, So, uh, uh, at the minute, um, our expertise is UK centric. So, we, anybody, so it does, it does, so it's like end to one mapping, right? From a, so, any, it's, it's a pretty standard protocol that they need to be. It doesn't matter if they're coming from India, Africa, or uh, so the, I'm asking currently, are you only focused between India? That's in India, so I'm, I'm talking here. I don't have outside contacts. But short answer is yes to your question. I am open to export any nation. I I would be glad to associate and making sure. That. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. Yes. This in uh, the UK. Uh, slightly complicated, much investment because uh, they have they are an established company. They have this process. Uh, all they're trying to do is to find new customers and in, uh, and put that into the pipeline, right? So that sort of business, and especially IT services, this applies for anything, any IT services, is you don't need a lot of investment at the beginning. You might need when, you, uh, when you're when trying to attract customers who are outside of your uh, core offering, then you might have to invest into your technology and things like that. Uh, but to begin with, they had come up, uh, they, they had this idea, they wanted some partner who can give them a base, where a big startup. So what they try, their cost is at the minute is just they're paying our office uh, and they're paying to their two employees. And all they're trying to do is to channelize it uh, to India to try and support them. And there are a few contracts that they were not able to win who are asking for UK-based office and UK-based services. And that's when they might have to invest uh, into their setting and uh, you know UK employees. Uh, but I think that's coming to be later. So short answer is it's not much funding that is required. Uh, so I Uh, opportunity to speak here. So uh, I'm a climate change communicator, and I speak predominantly for uh, you know advocating about climate change and even animal rights. So my husband and his brother uh, they manage the uh, nano IT services. They do a lot of things on the service side, and they said let's uh, you know do products. So they said why not uh, you know come and uh, buy and sell products, and then we 
make a business out of it. She said, you know, why don't you come and join? When I heard it, I said, it's a terrible idea. Me buying and selling, I don't think so, I'm, I'm for it. And people who know me personally know that I discourage buying. I encourage minimalism or conscious consumerism. If, uh, I mean, God forbid somebody takes me for shopping and says, what do you think of this? I would say, this has X, Y, Z, this is not recyclable, this is not toxic. And they'd be like, forget it. You're the wrong person to ask. And I'm, I'm not a person who encourages buying. Like, uh, most of my clothes are second hand. My, my shirt that I'm wearing is a second hand, or this coat is borrowed. So, to go and, you know, me and going and telling people buy, you know, it's, 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 very, it's very contradicting to me. So I said, it's a terror idea, let's forget it. So Vijay was like, you know, okay, fine. You don't, you don't get involved, but at least sell us choose something from the electronics so that we can buy and sell. Now, if you visit my home in UK, the very entrance next to the door, there's a big poster which, is, which has a picture of NASA, uh, Earth, uh, Earth picture of NASA. We have a photo of I don't have it here, but if you go to the NASA's website, there's a picture of Earth, and that's there in my corridor, and it says, this is our only home. So when I, for me, electronic gadgets nowadays, whatever is there, half of them is not required, it's not necessary. And then I'm like, Vijay, it comes to the same thing, that we will be dumping a lot of trash back to the planet again. Is this something that we want to do? So then this idea of nano green trade came, where we will go to everyday products that we, you know, the general public, the common people use, and uh, we will encourage them to choose more sustainably. So that's how uh, nano green trade came to be. So every time in our house or everywhere we go, we always follow this, that every time you spend money, you're casting a vote for the kind of world you want. Right? So when you invest, when you buy something, when you do business anything, you invest in the right thing and that it's a kind of the work. You know, be it from biscuits or chips to diamonds, you are casting the vote. So the next, yeah. Okay, so we started off this uh, nano green trade. We had this, we s selected very basic products of everyday use and then we started uh, calling vendors. Now I've got a team in Hyderabad who does you know, who shortlist vendors and and I get to speak to them on choosing the products in this. So I'd like to share this one particular conversation. The product was for a wooden comb and I spoke to this guy in uh, Delhi. So I said, and he gave me a lot of information about the product, about the wooden comb, which no other vendor had given. So I was pretty impressed and I said, I have one more question. How do you make sure, I know plastic combs are not good, using plastic is not good, but how do you make sure that your wood is sustainable. I know plastic is bad, but that doesn't mean you just keep cutting down trees and making copes. That itself is not sustainable. So how do you make sure that your, the wood that you source from is sustainable? So he was like, uh, I am I, I, assuming that everybody knows him the year. He said, Madam, our wood is uh, sustainable hair. We don't cut any tree. क्या होता है कि भारत बहुत बड़ा देश है और बहुत तूफान भी आते हैं इस देश में तो तूफान से जो पेड़ गिरते हैं हम वही पेड़ से हम कोम बनाते हैं सो आई वाज लाइक सी वेल इट यू नो इट सीम लाइक यू नो भैया तुम्हारी बिजनेस चलने के लिए तूफान आने चाहिए बट देन दैट्स नॉट द केस राइट इफ ओनली व्हेन देयर इज अ रीजनरेशन ऑफ वुड देन इटसेल्फ यू कॉल इट सस्टेनेबल सो देयर इज अ लॉट ऑफ गैप व्हेन वी वर्क विद आवर वेंडर्स व्हेन दे डू नॉट हैव द आईडिया ऑफ sustainability. So when I went in a shared to my team and I said this is what how we're going to look for and they said we don't expect small and medium scale enterprises in India to have this sustainability certification. I said no I don't expect them but somewhere there should be a start. You know if I, I speak to 10 vendors and I say where are you sourcing your material from if three of them come back I will tell the remaining seven, see these vendors have got its source and that is why we are going with them. Or at least these three vendors have tried something, why don't you as well try? It's not about competition or anything, it's about building the entire business to, you know, to bring them to it sustainably. So it's not just about economics, but also it's about environmental and social. Now there are a lot of things like, you know, these third world countries, China, India and Bangladesh, countries like this have a very bad reputation of 
cheap labor. So something, you get it very cheap in the, uh, in the foreign markets, but you're getting it at the expense of somebody's labor who's not being paid right. So we as a business want to make sure that sustainable solutions match all the three parameters. So it's not just an economic or even a social welfare, but also environmental welfare. <coughs> So this is the life cycle stage from resources to the waste. So when I talk about sustainability uh, about the resources, so we make sure that when you extract the resources, you extract, you avoid virgin resources. You just go with the resources already extracted as much as you can. And also there is efficiency of extraction, that is you make whatever is extracted, you make the most of it. Nothing goes waste in the raw material stage as well. The next one is processing. When you process the uh, materials, you make sure, that's what I just said, that as much of raw materials you have, you make sure that they go into the manufacturing stage. In manufacturing, you make sure that your processes are very efficient. The energy, whatever you use, be it energy or anything, is sustainable. And you use less of it. There is less pollution and less waste. Next is distribution. Distribution, we make sure that uh, you have an efficient distribution, that your packaging is recyclable, or is your packaging is efficient, that is you have more in just less number of pack packets or packaging. Use, predominantly there is a growing trend where everything is focused on the use, where your current product is, you know, when I go to buy, they say, okay, a consumer goes to buy and says, okay, this is very environment friendly, this is not toxic. It's predominantly on the use, but what happens from start to finish, the consumer is not aware, and even most of the businesses are not very keen about it. So yes, use is picking up, but we need an uh, entire life cycle that needs to be done sustainably. And then end of life, when I'm using the product after it, uh, the product is done, it should be back to the raw materials. It should not be just down onto the earth. So there are a lot of uh, resources available on each stage, and it's not just products, but even things like services, like design, marketing, how you can make it very uh, market, you know, environment friendly. A lot of resources out there, so you can you can either reach me or even you can uh, search it online. There are resources which will help you make your business uh, in a sustainable way. So, what is the benefits for business if you're done if you're doing it very sustainably? One is there is reduction in cost through resources efficiency. There have been a number of uh, UK companies who have benefited. They have. Only with material uh, resource extraction itself, they have done it efficiently and they have profited from it. So sustainable is not just a green word, it's not just climate change, it also brings you a lot of economic benefit. It builds resilience to changes in commodity prices and resource supply. Like for example, if you have renewable energy to, uh, as an energy input rather than oil or gas, it, it doesn't have the fluctuation of oil and gas. Renewable energy is more resilient, it's more sustainable. There is regulatory compliance and there is less risk of environment lapses and payment of disposal cost. Now this environment, uh, regulatory compliance, there are more and more uh, regulations around going to come up in the future to ensure that businesses are more sustainable. So before the law is put on us, it's better that we act proactively in that direction. And there is less risk of environment lapses. My favorite example here is the livestock industry. Because the amount of slurry and waste that goes in back to the environment pollutes the uh, land, water, and soil is no way countered. Not only, here, not only here, but also in UK. In UK, dairy industry is the highest in, in livestock in terms of environmental lapses. So before the government comes on you, or if before the people take charge and push the government to make laws, like, I, like you know, now there are first there were things like electric cars. Now there's like ban on plastic. You never know what's next. So as a business, it's always good to be geared up and uh, towards a sustainable aspect. So build sustainability, share lower carbon stories. When I was, uh, I was talking about my team, and I said I don't expect everybody to have a sustainability certification, but someone, every business, every vendor should make a start somewhere. Now we've all heard about high carbon stories, about climate change, about oil spills, about global warming, we all want to be high carbon. Now we need more of low carbon stories. So if any business, any of my vendor has started something on recycling, or if they've got a certification, footprint calculations, there are a lot of footprint calculations like ecological footprint, carbon footprint, water footprint. 
if they get the business, how much is their calculation and then how their idea to you know bring it down. Any corporate uh, uh, social responsibilities, if they bring in renewable energy to uh, run the business or even water conser uh, conservation, if they build in anything which conserves water in their factory. Any of this, we are ready to share it on our platform and encourage the vendor and even other vendors to, you know, to do it in the same way. So we want more of low carbon stories coming up from India and elsewhere in the world so that we can hope for a uh, better planet. Veganism and business, I don't know, uh, this picture, if you can see, it's a block point and there is animal flesh there. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard about veganism. Veganism is is not using any animal products for food, clothing, or anything else, even entertainment also. So now there is a growing trend that uh, people are avoiding to use animal products. So there is a growing trend, they say it's something cruelty free, not tested on animals. So there are more and more con uh, consumers and customers who want cruelty free products. Now this is an advertisement by Ecotricity. Ecotricity is a private energy supplier in UK and it's the only vegan certified company in the world. Now you, when you think of vegan, you think more of food, you think more of clothing. But would you ever imagine an energy company coming and saying that we are vegan certified? So that's the kind of uh, movement that is happening uh, towards, you know, an animal, uh, animal liberation. Now I have seen a lot of uh, uh, activism for different causes like for women rights, child rights, human rights, uh, forest conservation, climate change. Any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Supreme Courts and an issue of 
higher importance that can uh, make or break organizations. And today, um, we are going to discuss about that because we thought this particular need should be more practical oriented and you'll have actionable items by the time you uh, leave the meet. And uh, today we want to talk about uh, legal aspects and we have two brilliant legal experts here to give uh, their perspective and presentations. And may I request uh, Ms. Shandi Vindal to come on to this. She's the company secretary, she's an advocate, she is into arbitration, and I'm sure you have a lot of perspectives to gain from her lecture. And she will be talking about uh, business establishment in India, a company secretary's perspective. And may I request Ms. Purnima Kampi to come up to this? partner in Fox and & Mundo and Associates and she heads the Hyderabad based operations and for almost 20 years she is a practicing lawyer uh, especially related to FBI strategy and implementation. Uh, now I know what is uh, hot seat because CT is one of the experts. And may I now request uh, Ms. Shani Dinda to give her presentation on uh, establishment of business in India, uh, company securities perspective. What was their turnover? What is their capital? Who their directors are? What is the shareholding pattern? Who have they borrowed from the index of charges? What is the total borrowing that's available for public viewing? That's available for public downloading. So uh, to that extent, at least you can mitigate your risk because one thing is to get information from the website of the company, but it's another thing to see what they have officially filed with the government. So uh, this is a very, very important website and uh, it also has links to other government websites which you would require for doing any business or setting up uh, business. Of course, the RBI website is there and uh, uh, it's proactive, like I mean, you can, you can also ask questions and uh, they are frequently asked questions which are available. Uh, on our, in fact, even those who are doing business um, here, in case they need uh, uh, to find out anything, they can get into any of these government uh, sites and uh, you know get the information. Another important thing with the doing business is the import-export code, which we have again online. So a lot of our applications too are online today. And we use digital signatures to upload uh, applications. So most of the sites are all online. Any uh, other information which you, if you would like? Uh, yeah, I, sure. I have a question. Uh, you talked about repatriation. That's of right. Yeah. So if an investor is thinking of investing in India, uh, is there any... But uh, Purnima's presentation, though discussing about FDI, the entire perspective would be different. And she will be talking about enterprise legal perspective of uh, FDI as well as uh, in context of Indo-UK perspective. Thank you very much. That was a very nice presentation. I covered most of what I'm going to say here. But I'm happy you did that because that just pushes me into giving a little more in-depth sort of um, a practical understanding of how we have seen inbound and outbound investment evolve over the years. And I think both, when you read and hear both together, I guess there should be some value add that you should take away from here. I believe uh, collaborative efforts are the best efforts. And um, I think it's, a, it's been a pleasure listening to you and I hope to do justice to you going forward. Can we move on please? So I'm not going to now delve into every slide. I'm going to just sort, sort of touch upon those areas where I feel you know it's complementary to what you've already heard and additional information. Now, you are, uh, we first talk about inbound investment. So as you have seen, as you just heard it, uh, Shani mention about the um, various options available as an entry point into India. So it could be a wholly owned subsidiary, could be a branch, could be a uh, liaison office, you could set up a joint venture. These are all the various options available to you. But before, so I'm not even touching upon the re regulatory aspect now because that has been touched upon to some extent. I think I will pause here and talk about the practical aspect. 
before you come into India in either of these um, uh, vehicles, the first thing is to choose the right partner. If you choose the right partner, half the battle is won because your partner is going to be enabling. How do you choose the right partner? Choosing the right partner depends on right diligence as well. And therefore your diligence becomes very important. Why is diligence important? So I'll give you an example. Suppose you're coming into uh, a joint venture which is where you're going to have a 51% shareholding. You know, obviously dependent on the sectoral cap, while most of the as, uh, activities are under the um, uh, you know, automatic route, there are some where you have a 76% cap or, you know, things like that. And you may decide you don't want to set up, or for completely commercial reasons, you may decide not to set up a wholly owned subsidiary and coming in as a joint venture. So your diligence becomes very important. A, if you're doing a separate joint venture, the uh, diligence on the individual is always good. If you are doing, if you are investing into a company, if you are, uh, if it's an m and and you are acquiring the equity of a company, you are then buying into the health of the company. If there are old legacy issues in the company, then you will be sharing in those legacy issues. So the thought process that, you know, this happened prior to my coming in and therefore, you know, it's not going to be my liability, I've heard very, very seasoned companies say, okay, we were not directors at that stage, so if there's a non-compliance about a director, it's his responsibility, it's not mine, it's the previous shareholders, the, the majority shareholders' responsibility, it is not so. Once you have come in, you share in the health of the company. And if there is a violation, non-compliance, you are equally liable. Sometimes, depend, and usually when they are financial non-compliances, they could have penal consequences. And today, a director of a company is exposed to a lot of, uh, uh, you know, penal consequences. And therefore, directors today carry a lot of responsibility. Gone are the days where you could just say, I'm an independent director, or I'm just a nominee director on the board. There are Supreme Court judgments now. There is a judgment, very recent judgment, which says even a nominee director by a venture capital could be, would be liable for compliance. Therefore, the health of the company becomes extremely important. Therefore, diligence, please do not undervalue diligence. It may not be mandated under any law as such. If there may be no regulatory mandate saying you have to do a diligence. But for your own health of your own uh, investment, your own well-being, please ensure that you do a diligence on the company. We could, uh, so, so as you've already heard, these are the various, um, uh, you know, government uh, laws. So uh, you have the FEMA and you have, uh, I'll be taking you forward and uh, showing you the other regulations that are there. And you know the RBI, Ministry of Finance, DIP, DIP is extremely important. In fact, you should, if you are looking to come into India, make it a habit of visiting the DIP website. And, and look into their Q&A uh, section, the FAQ section. You will find most of your concerns addressed there. And also, you can post queries there. Challenges, they want your identity, they want your information. And you may not be in a position to give that sort of in, uh, information. So you have to articulate your question very uh, responsibly. We can move to the next slide, please. Uh, we've spoken about this. You are aware now the entry routes and uh, what are the approval, uh, what are the, the caps, etc. was mentioned very well by Shalini. Uh, we can move on. I'll skip these slides which are uh, uh, going to be repetitive in nature. We can move on. As you're aware, certain, there are certain sectors where you have sectoral caps. Those sectoral caps, uh, you can up to those sectoral caps if you come under the automatic route. And um, beyond that, of course, it, uh, you know, you have to look at the various sectoral caps and understand how you have to uh, approach the government for the same, for approval. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Uh, okay, so who is an eligible investor into India? Any non-resident individual, NRI entity, can invest subject to FDI policy, which has been explained to you. Company, trust or partnership incorporated in India and owned and controlled by NRIs, foreign institution, in, institutional investors and foreign portfolio investors 
Registered FIIs, FBIs, NRIs can invest or trade through a registered broker of Indian companies or recognized stock exchanges. One uh, entity we've not, I've not spoken about, and I think uh, you must understand the role. So I'm, I'm, these are things that have now you've heard. There is an authorized dealer, and more, all your financial transactions have to be done through the authorized dealer. Authorized dealers are certain banks, and yeah, they, they are the authorized. They are they are uh, they are mandated by the RBI to interact with the RBI on behalf of the investor. So the authorized dealer becomes very important. A lot of your queries that you have will be sorted by the authorized dealer. In fact, we as a law firm work very closely with authorized dealers like HSBC, etc. Because on a regular basis, when we get queries where, where we find that you know um, off-the-cuff answers are not available, or where we are structuring, for example, I'll be coming to that part as well, the structuring part. When we are structuring a transaction, so coming in through these entities, this is very clear, the routes are very clear, sectoral caps are very well recorded, but when you are coming in, that is the time when the commercials are being frozen. So you've done your diligence, that's out of the way, you're comfortable with your partner, now you're doing a, uh, you're actually writing down the contract. Usually in JVs this challenge happens, where both parties are commercially going to live together. So if you're, of course, even in your shareholders agreement, suppose you're buying, um, you know, it's not a wholly owned subsidiary and you're acquiring shares in a company. Then, of course, even then, this shareholders uh, uh, agreement, subscription agreement, there are nuances. There are commercial nuances which you need to capture after mitigating all risks. So how do you capture those nuances? You structure your transaction. Many times you have deferred payments. So for the longest time, deferred consideration was an issue, you know. But now there have been certain changes recently. So one more thing you should keep in mind is the the ease of doing business in India is also going through an evolution. There are regulations changing. There are, there, for the longest time, certain parts of the New Companies Act were not operative. They are, they are now operative. Uh, there are changes coming in on a regular basis to make it more comfortable and convenient to do business in India. And that means many things which were not permissible earlier, could not be done earlier, are also undergoing a change. For example, things like pledging of shares, things like those are also. So you need to be very closely networked with your counsel, whoever is advising you, and start taking the advice of your advisor, not once you have finalized your commercials. Come to us before finalizing your commercials. Because sometimes you finalize your commercials and then you find it is not permissible under the uh, existing laws and that becomes a challenge because you have probably at the time of your LOI itself given some term sheet itself given some consideration or made a timeline and imposed penalties on yourself if that timeline doesn't happen for example you say okay my exclusivity will go away after 30 days if the transaction is not completed in 30 or 45 or 60 days now you yourself put yourself in a vulnerable situation. Therefore, our advice is that the structuring should be hand in hand with the lawyer only because laws are continuously changing. This, the, we are in an evolutionary stage right now where even ease of doing business and investing in India is being experimented upon by the government. Therefore, please involve us from the beginning and this is not a business pitch. This is in your interest. Uh, I'll be very happy if you take Shalini, but please involve her from day one. Yeah. So, so given that situation, now you, I'm, I'm pausing here. I'm not going into the further slides related to inbound investment because that has very, very, very well been articulated. I'm going to talk about structuring your transaction. So, when you're structuring your transaction, so for example, if it's a JV and you decide you need a 50-50 partnership. That is challenging because 50-50 partnership means 50-50 representation on board. And of course, your requirements under the Companies Act of having an independent director and all those other things are there. But the essence of your decision making on the board is 50-50. Deadlock situations arise. When deadlock happens, how are you going to deal with it? 
are you going to make a committee under the board who's going to look at the matter and then you know their decision is going to be binding if there is a breakdown are you going to buy out the other party how what is the valuation that you're going to do now you have to put your valuations up front you can't say i will value that and then your valuations have to be as per the guidelines so you have to keep all those aspects in mind while you're doing your structuring many times you put this you you defer your consideration based on milestones and when you are doing that you want an escrow arrangement uh, families can come together and buy a property but then tomorrow you can't gift it to a resident so those issues are there you can inherit a share but you you can gift it to a non resident uh, uh, you know resident outside of india but you can't gift it to a resident so if you're thinking i'll buy then gift it to uh, the relative permitted under income tax act it won't work that way right so things like those are there now general permission to acquire foreign securities as gift from any person resident outside india to acquire shares under cashless employee stock option program to acquire shares by way of inheritance to acquire qualification shares for becoming a director of a company outside india to acquire shares in lieu of part full consideration of professional services rendered to the foreign company or in lieu of director's remuneration we are happy to do that uh, you know if anyone wants to do that we are happy to do that um, then to purchase of shares to purchase shares of a joint venture uh, wholly owned subsidiary abroad of the indian promoter company by the employees directors of indian promoter companies in a nutshell these are some of the uh, uh, you know per permissible activities under the general pr uh, permission speaking of then you have the automatic route this automatic route now we are coming to the wholly owned subsidiaries and uh, companies the corporate entities so far we are talking about what an individual can do now we are talking about so th that is individual and person defined under the act but this is uh, restricted so automatic route is restricted to uh, uh, the following can make investments in a joint venture wholly owned subsidiary and it is restricted to these yeah a company incorporated in india a company created under the an act of parliament uh, a body created under an act of parliament a partnership firm a limited liability partnership incorporated under the llp act so these are the companies which come under the automatic route for investing in a jv and a wholly owned subsidiary we can move on we can move on yeah oh sorry yeah so uh, indian party shall not be on this so who are the people who cannot uh, even if you have these permitted routes you cannot go under them is somebody who is under exporters caution list list of de uh, defaulters under investigation by the directorate of enforcement or any investigative agency or regulatory authority so it's very important that you keep yourself clean don't have any um, issues with any of these authorities and the indian party routes all the transactions relating to the investment in a jv wos through only one branch of an authorized dealer to be designated by the indian party again you see the word authorized dealer it's very important and it's important you choose your authorized dealer correctly to move on so i think i'm taking too much of the time which is allotted to me do i still have time i'm sure the question answers then so perhaps some of that right 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 so so i think in a nutshell this is how it is i'll quickly quickly touch upon uk uh, as i told you it um, you know there are people here who are already informed but if there is ease of incorporation there are very few in sector so like we have sectoral caps i am told that there are no sectoral caps there in the uk there are certain areas where you will need permission like financial and defense i think if i'm not mistaken where you will need permission from the government to be able to uh, start your operations there but uh, there, there there appears to be considerable ease of doing business uh, in the uk is what i i am given to understand i think um, as an outbound investment from here regulatory compliance is extremely important here and compliance with the law of the land there are extremely important for example you may there may be something that is illegal in here in india may not be illegal in the host country so how would you invest there things like those you should understand first and then get, get into those transactions so with that i think uh, both of us uh, with our uh, complimentary presentation should have given you a good overview and if there are any other uh, 
questions, I'd be very happy to take them. And I'd request Shani to please come on the dais also so that if there's something we can answer. <laughs>